Making Toronto Transit Commission announce all bus and subway stops for blind riders. Lepofsky versus TTC. David Lepofsky, Chair, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Delivered at the Osgood Hall Law School, January 24, 2014, as a Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's, um, uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk to your seminar about test case uh, litigation in advocating for uh, accessibility for people with disabilities. I'm going to give you an unusual example because even though I happen to be a lawyer, I don't do test cases on disability rights as a lawyer. My, my activism has always been as a member of the community, as a volunteer. And in the example I'm going to give you, I wasn't the lawyer, I was the, uh, I was the client. Um, I had pro bono counsel in two cases who were fabulous. Uh, pro bono or unpaid volunteer legal work is something all lawyers should do, and I had, I had access to the best. In my first case, it was uh, Elizabeth Shulton, and then uh, later, uh, after she retired, uh, Mary Cornish from the Cavaluzzo Law Firm. In my second case, it was uh, Clifford Lax uh, from the uh, Lax O'Sullivan Law Firm. They each adduced my evidence, and the firms donated a junior counsel um, uh, to be, uh, assist me as I conducted the rest of the case myself. Uh, cross-examining, uh, argument, and so on, I, I did myself, but with the able assistance of, of junior lawyers uh, from their respective firms, and I'm very indebted to them for doing that. Um, in war, um, a country uh, in an uh, uh, armed conflict has several uh, different uh, ways to fight the war. They have navy, they have air force, if they're equipped with all this, they have ground army, they may have special forces, espionage and now cyber espionage or cyber warfare. Uh, and when a country is fighting a war with another country, they choose which of those will do the best uh, to assist them or in combination with, with others of them to achieve their, their goals. Uh, I'm not a war person, uh, but when it comes to trying to use, uh, uh, trying to achieve a community goal, or a social goal um, through advocacy efforts. We have several uh, weapons or uh, tools at our disposal. That can include organizing a coalition to advocate, whether it's for a law reform or for new policies. Uh, and it can involve test case litigation by an organization or just an individual bringing their own case on their own and all sorts of other things as well. And I've, I've involved myself um, since shortly after the end of my, my uh, law school days uh, in advocating for people with disabilities uh, in, a, in a volunteer role. And I've been involved in various of these, these different kinds of uh, efforts. When do you use which? That's gonna underlie what I'm talking about. But to get you there, I wanna, I, I wanna tell you the story of my case. I, uh, as a young person, I've been, uh, I had partial vision as a kid and lost uh, my remaining vision uh, actually when I was in law school, it was dropping gradually. And as a little kid, I was able to see out the window of the bus and that would help me find where to get off. But as my vision decreased, I, I wouldn't be able to tell which bus or subway station I was at uh, without assistance. On the subway, I had to be trained to count the stations and I hope I didn't lose count, and I hope somebody didn't talk to me while I was on the subway, leading me to lose count, and I hope that the train didn't stop for long stretches of time due to a breakdown, which might make me also lose count. On the bus, it's even trickier because the subway stops at all stops, but a bus doesn't. It'll pass stops uh, at minor locations or non-major intersections if nobody uh, pulls the, uh, the string to chime uh, to to ask the driver to let them off. So you can't count them, to be sure. Sighted people are accommodated in both way, in both subways and on buses by uh, having windows they can look out uh, to enable them to see where they are uh, and know where to get off. Not so much for blind people. In the 70s, around the time I was in law school, the Toronto Transit Commission tried an experiment for a while of audibly announcing all subway stops. I've also gotten word, and I have vague memory, but nothing specific, that they used to audibly announce all, 
uh, bus stops as well. The subway announcements were tried for a few weeks and were called off. Uh, the speaker system wasn't great. The volume varied a lot. They got, apparently, complaints from the public. I remember seeing one in the paper and uh, uh, contemplating writing a letter to the editor to respond, not knowing what this would later, uh, how big a part of my life this would all become. Um, it wasn't until 1994, many years later, that I decided to get active on this. It had crossed my mind. I've been in the States, in New York or San Francisco or uh, Washington or Boston where they, on the subways, they announce all, uh, all stops. And I remember thinking many a time, why aren't we doing this in Toronto? I remember TTC tried it and they said they were calling it off. They were going to study it further. How long do they need to study? I thought. But I didn't do anything about it. Along came the summer of 1994. And that's when this all began. Now, I'd like to see, uh, uh, you might like to think that as a person uh, very interested in disability advocacy that I sat down and I looked at a range of different issues that I might bring a test case over and I carefully studied which would be better than which and I analyzed them in terms of their possible social significance and so on. Uh, no, it's <laughs> not what I did. I just wrote a letter one day in, in June of uh, 1994 to ask the TTC, I asked the chief general manager, could you announce all stops? Uh, I'm blind and we need those stops on the subway announced. I didn't ask about buses because where I lived at the time, I, I was really only riding subways uh, to get to work and, and other major destinations. I really didn't use buses very much at all. It wasn't that it didn't. I, I, I thought it unimportant for others. It just wasn't central to my experience at the time. I got a letter back um, explaining that uh, it's not really feasible for their uh, subway crews to make these announcements, but that they were planning in a couple of years uh, to, in the, they were at the stage, uh, pardon me, they were in the process of planning to institute an automated system for subway stop announcements. I responded in writing, in effect, that with the position that I would carry forward, which is I'm not asking anybody to spend money on all this automation, um, and even if you're going to, could you have your crews announce the stops in the meantime? I couldn't get, an, I couldn't get a yes. So when September of uh, two, 1994, almost 20 years ago, rolled around, I did two things on the same day. I went over to the Human Rights Commission, which then had a public mandate to investigate and enforce human rights complaints. That regime has changed since. And I filed a complaint of discrimination against the Toronto Transit Commission discrimination in the provision of services because of my disability. And the second thing I did is I got on the radio. I'd set up an interview that morning, this is the first time I broke the story, on Toronto, CBC Toronto's uh, flagship Metro Morning program. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter at David Lepofsky or my coalition at AODA Alliance, we periodically tweet a link to that radio interview um, because it was the start of a long saga. The CBC had me on explaining what I need, and at the same time they had uh, a gentleman from the TTC saying, we can't really do this, uh, but we are putting in this new big system of automation that'll take a couple of years to institute. Many who heard that interview uh, were quickly on my side of this debate. That included people at TTC because it wasn't maybe two hours later that I got a phone call at my office from someone at TTC saying, could you come in for a meeting? We'd like to discuss this. Media coverage is often a very important tool in triggering change in this area. I had a, uh, a friend go with me to the meeting. I was ready for a huge fight. I was ready to make all the arguments about why I'm right and why they're wrong. But I never had to make the arguments because when I went to that meeting a week later, the, the gentleman who was on the radio on the other side named Jerry Broly, a senior person at TTC at the time, said, I'm, I'm opening my mouth to start making all the arguments that we as law students or lawyers are, are trained to make, and he said, we're going to do it. All of a sudden, I'd won. They wanted a couple of months to get people ready for it, and they wanted to be able to do it right, so could we, could, would I be agreeable to them not uh, proceeding until uh, the start of the next year? I said, sure. Uh, and in December of that year, when they announced, December 1994, when they announced that these were uh, going to start, they actually, CBC Radio had me 
and Jerry Broglion again, but not against each other, but together, me thanking them and congratulating them and them expressing appreciation for my raising the issue. Well, in 1995, the announcement started on the subway, but it didn't go so well. Depending on the train you got on, we found that they announced all the stops, or some of the stops, or none of the stops. Well, unless it's consistently done, this is very useful for a blind person, you gotta keep counting the stops, taking off your, your gloves and your shoes and counting on your fingers and toes, and hoping you don't lose count. I started writing letters over the next uh, five or uh, so years, uh, as five or six years, I think I wrote around 30 different times, to raise concerns. They uh, wrote me back at one point uh, that year in uh, 1995 saying, could you please get us the number of the train where you're having the problem when it happens? Mm -hmm. Now, for one thing, I can't see. And for another thing, I thought the number's on the outside, so I'm supposed to get out and run alongside. Well, it turns out, in every, you don't know this probably, but in every train there's a red number, four digits, starts with a five. Um, and so what happened is I'd be on the train and I'd, I, they weren't announcing stops, so I'd turn to some complete stranger and say, excuse me, there's a number up there in red that starts with a five, it's four digits, would you tell me which it is? I'm sure people thought I was crazy. And I'd write letters in and they'd write back saying we're investigating it and so on. And they gave me every excuse you could imagine, including we're going to put in a new radio system. Well, they then put in a new radio system and it didn't make anything any better. Back and forth and back and forth. Finally, 2001 rolls around. And I said, enough. And I filed a human rights complaint. Now, I, je I, I filed a second human rights complaint. The first one I didn't proceed with because my complaint was they said they wouldn't announce stops and they said they'd start. That has significance. It's going to come up in a moment. Uh, but I filed this complaint and, and I genuinely thought this has got to settle because they got no defense. Um, well, 2001 rolls into 2002. We end up going into a mediation process. I can't tell you about the content of that because there's obviously an undertaking of confidentiality, but I can say the one public fact is it failed. And I went on to a hearing. While this process was unfolding, TTC decided the, the automated system that they promised in 94 would be instituted in 96 was called off. Now, in, uh, in the early 2000s, they just, with my litigation pending, they decided to go back and go for an automated system. So the issue, in my case, boiled down to this. If they're going to have an automated system up running in a couple of years, are they obliged to have their, their subway crews audibly announce all stops in the meantime? We couldn't resolve that, and so it went to a hearing. The hearing took place before the tri Human Rights Tribunal. Under the old regime, there was a lawyer from the Human Rights Commission presenting. I had pro bono counsel, as I said, calling my evidence and the rest of the hearing I did myself with the benefit of a, a junior from the law firm, a junior counsel from the law firm that uh, was provided the pro bono service. So you're gonna ask me, what was the issue? Well, it began with them bringing a whole bunch of procedural motions to tie up a couple of days, claiming they weren't given enough notice of what I was asking for. I was asking for audible stop announcements. It's not too hard to figure out. Uh, claiming uh, that uh, the I should only be able to sue the TTC, not the chief general uh, manager and then named Rick Ducharme. Um, we said he's on the hook because he was part of the decision making. He was writing some of the key letters. Well, the tribunal uh, cut him out of the claim, uh, which to this day I think was unfortunate because that individual accountability would have helped make some for, for more change. At the hearing, I testified that I need to know what stop I'm at and they're not tell and they, the stop announcements aren't reliable and they didn't dispute that. I called an expert, or the, t the, t the Human Rights Commission called an expert, Ms. Uh, Leslie McDonald, who teaches white cane and mobility training to, to blind people. TTC at one point objected to her as an expert because she also was a friend of mine. The, t the tribunal rejected that argument because the Human Rights Commission showed that she'd also done consulting for TTC. <laughs> so they were hardly in a position to talk about either that she, her advice wasn't worth taking or that she had a unilateral connection with me. We were quite open the fact that we um, that, that we were friends, but she, it, all she was saying is blind people, in some sense, blind people need to know what stop they're at, which one would imagine you don't even need an expert to show this, just help make our case. So what was their defense? Under the Human Rights Code, they, they have a legal defense saying we can't accommodate, without, we, it, would be un, it would be undue hardship to TTC to accommodate by making all route stop announcements, but they didn't argue that and they couldn't argue that. 
because it was their own policy that they had directed their operators to announce all stops. Their own documentation showed that they weren't consistently doing it, that their rate of doing it when they were audited only went as high as 88% and went as low as 57% of the time, and that's when audited. And between the lines, what their real argument sounded like is we can't really get our drivers to do anymore. But they didn't adduce any evidence of that. They didn't adduce any pushback from the union. Most people think the union was against it. We had no, they weren't, a, the union wasn't a party. And there was, we asked for just documentation of any exchanges between them and the union. And there was none. There was no evidence that the union went and said, don't make us do this or got in the way. Um, so we had this hearing. And when it was over, after the evidence was taken in, the adjudicator, um, uh, a retired Superior Court Justice Alvin Rosenberg, sadly he passed away last, last year, Justice Rosenberg um, reserved. Now, usually the Human Rights Tribunal reserved for some time. He reserved for 20 minutes. He said, can I just come back in a few minutes? And we all looked at each other, what's going on? He came back in, and 20 minutes after we finished oral argument, he came in and said that he was finding uh, that, the, uh, human, that the TTC had been violating my human rights and the human rights of blind Torontonians for at least 10 years, that he would issue orders, but he wanted to make that finding promptly. Um, it was quite an amazing day, and it got a ton of media coverage. Um, he issued groundbreaking orders, but not anywhere near as much as we asked for. He ordered that the TTC um, uh, announce all route stops, train their uh, crews on it, train senior management on human rights, uh, but a significant new uh, order uh, in this context was he appointed the former chair of the Human Rights Tribunal, Matthew Garfield, to be an official monitor. An official monitor, paid for by the TTC, is a, in effect a representative of the Human Rights Tribunal who will oversee the implementation of the remedies. This had only been ordered once, that, to our knowledge, in Canada. It was ordered in a case called McKinnon. It was a race-based case where there was show, uh, a proof that the um, Ontario prison system had rampant racist, racism problems with, with uh, prison guards. Uh, we didn't have that kind of rampant, virulent uh, case to show, but nonetheless, the monitor was uh, ordered. Let me move quickly to the second case. Oh, by the way, one of the orders they had to train their, their uh, employees, TTC called me and asked if I would be in a video. I actually sat in an empty subway car with a couple of TTC crew, and they interviewed me and others, other blind people about why we needed stop announcements. This was really quite cool. And we were on their video. I have a copy of it. Now, around this time, we won in 05, just around that time, I had been hearing from various blind people that, you know, you should push for bus stop announcements too. And also, I um, was looking at moving to a location, uh, 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 to live in a location where I was going to need bus access. So I was now in a position to be a, a plaintiff in this. I had made the request. And I reiterated it after I won this case. I, went to, I wrote this head of the TTC, Rick Ducharme, and I said, look, you know, you've got to announce all uh, subway stops, so surely you've got to announce all bus stops. The TTC's response was that their policy is to announce major intersections on buses and streetcars and to announce um, um, your stop at your request. My response, shared by, I will tell you, other blind people, is that if you ask the driver to call your own stop, they can forget, because they've got to hold in their head who asked for what. My position was, if you ask them to call all stops, it becomes proceduralized, it becomes routine. They will just do it. They don't have to remember your particular stop. Well, you might think that it, it follows pretty obviously that if you've got to announce all subway stops, you also got to announce all bus stops. I thought that. Everybody I know thought that, except the TTC. So I had to bring my second case. It is very weird having a case named after you, Lepofsky versus TTC. It is even odder to have two. In the second case, um, we went back before the Human Rights Tribunal. The TTC had the same lawyer, a very good lawyer and a very honorable person, fighting the best uh, she could for her, her client. And we had the same adjudicator, uh, retired Justice Rosenberg. Um, this case came on for hearing in 2007. So what was their defense? They couldn't argue that we didn't need route stop announcements called, because as I said at the start of my talk, we need them at least as much on the subway, if not more, because you can't count bus stops reliably, because buses don't stop at all stops. Well, their defense was that it would be a danger to the public 
for bus drivers or streetcar drivers to go beyond calling in uh, major intersections and, uh, and requested stops and go all the way to calling all stops, that they would be distract them, that essentially there could be, uh, people could get hurt, there could be accidents because of calling stops. This is my, I, I characterize this as the bus drivers can't walk and chew gum at the same time uh, argument. Um, our response to it was this. Number one, they didn't call a bus driver to testify they can't do it. Number two, they're not even adhering to their own policy because their own audits in the last couple of years showed that for the most part they were announcing the major intersections even less frequently than they were announcing subway stops and their inadequate subway stop announcements were a violation of the Human Rights Code and were found to be such. Our next argument was that this danger thing is not their real reason for why they refused. I had been on CBC Metro Morning talking about this issue and then the then chair of the TTC, Howard Mosca, was, on, uh, all, was also on, not at the same time, and he said the reason that they weren't going to call tell their drivers to call stops is because they said it would be, he said it would be a major administrative hassle to have to discipline their, their drivers for non-compliance. And he went on in the interview to say, on the radio, I know that's no excuse. I put that audio tape, put all these interviews, eventually ended up in the record in these various cases. Well, so I said, that's not, the danger thing isn't the real reason. Moreover, we adduced evidence from, in cross-examination from the TTC that they, they had actually commended their own drivers who call all stops. So do you give a commendation to people who, your own drivers, if they're endangering people? Come on. Moreover, their own internal policy showed that they, they tell their drivers to call all stops if the bus is crowded or the weather is inclement outside. And some of them even said, or if there's a visually impaired person on the bus. Well, bus is crowded or inclement weather, that means we'll call all stops to accommodate sighted people who can't see outside. You should be doing the same thing for blind people who can't see outside. Well, there's more to it, but I'm synthesizing. But the Human Rights Tribunal ruled quite promptly, not in 20 minutes, but within a couple of weeks, that the TTC had again violated the human rights of blind people by not consistently uh, calling all bus stops. By the way, I should explain that even before I brought this case claim, but while the, the subway's claim was pending, the TTC had announced that they were going to bring in a system of automated bus stop and bus announcements in the buses, not just the subways. So the issue in, just as the issue in case number one was, uh, do you have to make uh, human being announcements uh, while you're waiting for the uh, automation to be installed? And the answer was yes. The issue in the second case is, does the TTC have to have human being announcements while they're waiting for the bus announcements to be installed? And the answer was, I know this is shocking, yes. So, and it, the tribunal uh, ruled uh, in my favor. The orders in the second case are, are really interesting. I'm going to take a minute on that and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, again, there was an order to comply. As in the first case, there was an order for the TTC to monitor its compliance and report monthly on, uh, on compliance. Uh, the same official monitor, Matthew Garfield, was ordered to uh, take on the official monitor role on this uh, case as well. He's still in effect now this many years later, um, uh, monitoring implementation. Um, but, uh, and the TTC was ordered to have uh, uh, an action plan or an implementation plan devised within 15 days of the order to be implemented within 30 days of the order. So they were told to get into action very quickly. And to the TTC's credit, they did. After the first case, the order in the first case, they had a, a consistent uh, substantially improved audible subway announcements within weeks and same within weeks of the bus ruling. But the second case went further. You see, there were some remedies I asked for in the first case, which I didn't get, TTC opposed, but in the second case, I did get. I told the ju Justice Rosenberg that we now have a recidivist. We have a repeat offender here. And it's a government agency. It's part of the city of Toronto. And I argued that they've shown that they just aren't going to get it unless you impose some more orders. 
The two critical orders I asked for were these that I got. There's one I didn't get, but there's two critical ones I did get. We showed in evidence in both cases the TTC had received a, you know, a number of complaints over the years about the failure to provide these announcements. And we also showed that senior management didn't know those complaints had been coming through their complaints department. And the commissioners, the uh, board of governors of the TTC also didn't know. So we argued that it, we need to change at the top. They need to hear directly from passengers with disabilities, not just blind folks, but others about the problems they face. So we asked that the TTC be ordered to hold an annual open, advertised, accessible public forum on accessible transit issues, and that all senior managers and all commissioners be required to attend. The tribunal ordered that for three successive years. By the way, the TTC opposed the order initially. Within holding, after holding the first such event, which hundreds of people attended, the TTC under, thought it was such a good idea that they agreed they'd keep doing it after the three years, and they're still doing it to this day. We also got it mandated for all transit authorities under the, public tra uh, the Accessible Transportation Regulation passed under the Disabilities Act, all inspired from our experience here. I said there were two uh, really important orders, and we'd never seen anything like this before under the Human Rights Code. The other one was this. It became clear to us that nobody in senior management was being held accountable if they mess up on this issue. They perform, uh, senior managers at TTC all undergo something which they do in a lot of organizations called an annual performance review where you set your goals for the next year and you get reviewed on how you're doing on your goals for the last year. We proved in cross-examination that they do this annual performance review, that there's no requirement to look into anything about the manager's performance on disability, accessibility, and accommodation. And so it's not even the basis of a review. So you can do really bad for years and you'll never get reviewed or held to account on it. So we asked the tribunal to make an order requiring that this be incorporated, and it, the tribunal did. He ordered that Accessibility be built into job descriptions in various ways at senior management and that it be part of their annual performance review and take into account in pay and promotion. I'd never heard of this being done anywhere. TTC, to their credit, while they opposed the order when I sought it, once it was ordered, we, I was told that they actually extended it from senior management to all employees, which I think is a real potential for making uh, change. The order I didn't get uh, was I asked for the uh, TTC to be ordered to create a disability accessibility ombudsperson to deal with these complaints because their internal complaint system uh, didn't seem to work. I didn't get the order, but the tribunal kept re retained, uh, uh, decided that it was, would remain seized of the matter, and I could come back later if that order is needed, and that's still an opportunity open to me uh, to this day. Let me offer you some conclusions. Number one, this case has had huge impact well beyond anything I expected. It led the, the uh, Ontario government to agree to require all stop announcements be made uh, in all public transit across the province under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. I've heard it's gotten picked up in other parts of Canada. Um, I get feedback on this case from people all the time, mostly sighted people who find the announcements are really helpful for sighted people who can't see through crowds or want to read a book. It's a, f uh, in my experience, it became and I didn't foresee this in advance, but it became a good illustration of how accommodating us helps everyone. That it isn't a matter of accessibility for us comes at the price of what other people uh, without disabilities might want. It shows that what's good for us is typically good for everyone and it helps build the case for accessibility. It's a case that people remember. I, I've been involved in disability advocacy on the Disability Act for years. Most people out there don't know that, but you'd be amazed how many people walk up to me and say, oh, you're the guy with the subways thing or the buses thing, I think of you when I hear those announcements. It's because every time they hear the announcements, it reminds them of the news stories that, 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 that the TTC opposed us. Um, and, that, and then they think about how this, the announcements are helpful for them. Why did the TTC oppose it in the first place? To the Human Rights Commission's credit, they did a survey of all uh, transit authorities um, right, uh, shortly after I won, urging them to all do the same as it's required by law. Illustrative of the kind of impediments we face, some said yes, but some said no, and some who said yes still didn't until the Human Rights Commission had to institute proceedings against them. One public transit authority, London, was quoted in the London Free Press as saying, they'll put in automated announcements, but they're not going to direct their, their crews to do it manually or per, you know, by human being announcement in advance. This is, the, this is the law. But they decided that 
it was arbitrary, I think was the word that the, guy, that the fellow used. So I guess they decided they don't have to obey the law. Um, the other thing that this case illustrated was to explode a myth. A common myth out there is that accommodating us is always about money, it's all the cost. Well, it often isn't. And in this case, they could have provided this accommodation without anything beyond training costs. We, I didn't ask for any automated, fancy, high-power technolo technology as a solution. Every bus or subway has a driver. They all have a mouth. They all have a microphone, and I hope they know where they are. So just tell us. Um, but in this case, the money issue cut the opposite way. After the case was over, I filed a human rights, or pardon me, a freedom of information request to get the TTC's legal bills. I wanted to see how much they paid their lawyers. I got nothing against the lawyers. I'm not saying the lawyers was, was billing inappropriately, but how much did they pay to oppose these claims? Well, the bills came in and we added them up. Between the two lawsuits, they spent $450,000 on lawyers to oppose these two claims. I could have bought a lot of accessibility. So, in the end, it was an incredible learning experience for me. I would tell you that in deciding to bring a test case, you never know at the beginning where it's going to end up at the end. You can't foresee that it's going to have these ramifications, and I sure didn't. I just carried on with the case because I thought the request was reasonable, and I couldn't believe they wouldn't settle. And then when they didn't settle, it was either quit, which I wasn't prepared to do, or keep on going, which I did. It was as simple as that. But this case has really helped with the broader campaign for accessibility. It's helped highlight things. But what's amazing beyond every other experience I've had is how the world has changed. Because if you read, I've read in one Toronto Star article, they now refer to the announcements on the TTC as iconic. And anybody I've talked to at the TTC, including people who were opposing me at the time, have said to me they actually agreed with my position. Now, I think they were being genuine. What's actually, what, what it reveals is the capacity of an organization to do the wrong thing because they can without really thinking it through and without being held accountable. And I'm hoping the remedies I sought will help, will help change that. Thank you very much for the chance to speak to you and I, and I look forward to your, to your questions. Here's a PS to my talk on the transit, on the case against the Toronto Transit Commission. I mentioned at one point that the, the exchange I had with uh, TTC in 1994 uh, came into play in the 2005 case. Here's how it happened. Back in 94, I filed a complaint saying I, uh, uh, I, the TTC was violating my human rights case, uh, my human rights because they were not requiring their uh, operators to announce route stops. They announced that they were going to uh, direct their operators to announce route stops, so I discontinued that complaint. In 2005, the TTC tried to argue at the hearing that they should not have a finding of discrimination against them that because, in effect, in, in 1994, I had agreed to withhold any future claims on the quality of the announcements, that simply by starting to make announcements in 1995, they had absolved themselves of any obligation to me uh, to make sure those announcements were made consistently and reliably. I responded at the 2005 Subways case uh, by arguing that, that was, uh, no such, there was no such agreement. I didn't sign any settlement agreement to that effect. I hadn't waived my future human rights. And needless to say, I wouldn't uh, under those circumstances. Ultimately, the Human Rights Tribunal agreed with me, rejected that argument, and found that the TTC had violated uh, the human rights uh, of me and other blind Torontonians for at least a decade by not consistently and reliably announcing uh, all subway stops.